The beauty of reinforcement learning lies in the fact that agents learn on their own and do not require any external knowledge of the particular problem they are trying to solve. The learning algorithms that make this possible have evolved since the 1950s and combined with today's hardware, reinforcement learning is touching new heights and getting closer to general AI step by step. Welcome to the second video of this series where we will be going deeper into reinforcement learning and study several methods that are applied to get problems solved. Welcome to Campus X. Subscribe to keep following this series. Sit back, relax and learn. In the last video, we talked about the agent environment interaction extensively. This interaction has a fancy name called a Markov decision process. MDPs have well-defined probability distributions that are dependent only on the preceding state and action. Here, the equation summarizes the dynamics of the MDP, which is what is the probability of seeing state S dash and reward R given state S and action A. But MDPs have a special property which is used to make things simpler in reinforcement learning that is called the Markov property. It states that the future is independent of the past given the present. This might seem like a philosophical statement but has mathematical simplicity attached to it. In the real world, one might think that the probability of seeing state S dash and reward R depends on the full history of the trajectory taken by the agent. But Markov property makes it simpler by saying that once the preceding state is known, the full history can be thrown away therefore making the dependence of state S dash and reward R only on the previous state. It turns out that this simple property is of great help in reinforcement learning. In the previous video, I skipped an important component and that is model. What is a model? Well, a model is used to simulate the environment and produce simulated experience. A model can be anything that the agent uses to predict how the environment will respond to its actions. Given a state and an action, a model produces a prediction of the next state and next reward. Think about it, isn't it convenient? The agent doesn't even have to take an action in the environment. It can get the next state and reward from the model and estimate whether the action is suitable or not. This model can be used by the agent to plan its trajectory through the environment. But sometimes the model is not available. The model can be unavailable for a variety of reasons. It can be that the environment is so complex that it cannot be simulated. In methods where we use a model are called model based reinforcement learning methods. In methods where we do not use a model are called model free reinforcement learning methods. Now a question might arise here. When an agent uses a model, it can get the next state for an action from the model and estimate the value of the next state. Then the agent can decide whether taking that action would be beneficial or not. But how is the same applied in model free methods? How does the agent weigh different actions without the model? To assess the impact of actions from a certain state, we modify our value function a little bit. Our old value function takes in a state and returns a value for that particular state. Now we modify our value function to take in a state and an action and to return a value estimate for that. So effectively, it is calculating the values for different actions in a particular state. The agent can use these values to take the action with the maximum value. Our old value function is called state value function, whereas our new one is called action value function. It turns out that this action value estimate is used very widely and we have certain algorithms named after it such as Q-learning. A major problem of the reinforcement learning agents is the exploration exploitation dilemma. What this means is how do we decide when the agent should explore and when should they exploit what they have learned. This dilemma is quite common and people have used methods that partly solve the problem. The simplest way to select actions in model free methods is to select the action with the most action value. This is called greedy selection. An alternative is to behave greedily most of the time but with small probability, epsilon, select any action randomly. This is called an epsilon greedy action selection rule. Now during the training process, we decay this epsilon over time 
to reduce exploration and increase the exploitation of the knowledge that the agent has acquired. Now let's put these components into use and see what learning algorithms we can create. What we have not talked about till now is what the policy and value function is made up of. These functions can be made using a table where for each state there is a row in the table and its corresponding data that it's supposed to hold. Or these functions can be made using function approximators like neural networks. Since early reinforcement learning methods used tables, we will start off with tables. For a fair amount of time, I have been saying that the value for a state is calculated for a particular policy pi. What does this mean? It means that the values of all the states are tied to a particular policy. If the policy changes, the values will also change. Why? Think about it. If the policy changes, your behavior in the environment changes, the rewards you will get change, the returns that you will estimate change, and thus the values will also change. So it's very important to keep this in mind. But values are not magical numbers. They need to be calculated. To calculate the values for all the states, dynamic programming methods use a simple trick. We already know that the equation of the state value function is the expected return at that state and following policy pi. But this return can be unfolded a little and written as RT plus one plus gamma into return for the next state. Notice we have included the discount factor here. Now this return for the next step is actually the values for the next state. So you are calculating the values for the current state, considering the reward for that step and the values for the next state. Armed with this new equation, we are now ready to calculate the values for a particular policy pi. This step is called policy evaluation or prediction problem. To understand the next steps, let us consider a grid world example. This is a 4 cross 4 grid with the top left and bottom right cells as the terminal cells. The agent can start anywhere in these cells mark 1 to 14. There are 4 actions, left, right, top and bottom. The reward for each transition is minus 1. Our states are all the individual cells, cell 1 is state 1, cell 2 is state 2 and so on. We will start off completely randomly. We start with a random policy where the agent takes all four actions uniformly randomly in all states. The values for all states are initialized to zero. Now we perform a policy evaluation step to find the values of this random policy using our new equation. The values for this random policy turns out to be this. Now what? Now we can take a greedy step to improve our policy using these values. Let's focus on cell 1. Only for the left action, the next state has a value of 0, which is an increase from the current minus 1. For all other actions, the values remain constant if those actions are taken. Note here that taking an up action will result in cell 1 just as if the agent strikes a wall. Since we found out that the left action will give us more values, we improve our policy at this state to take a left action only. Same is the case with cell 4. Here the up action results in an increase in values, therefore the policy is improved to take an up action in this cell. These improvement steps are applied to all the states and this is the resulting new policy. Notice it has improved from the previous random policy. This step is named as policy improvement or control problem. We now repeat the same steps to find out the new values for this policy and then we perform an improvement step. After sufficient number of iterations, the values in the policy converge to an optimum. The cycle of policy evaluation and policy improvement is called policy iteration. If we ignore the granularity of the evaluation and improvement step, we end up with generalized policy iteration. We follow this cycle of evaluation, which is predicting the values for a policy and then improvement, which is acting greedily with respect to the values. Slowly, these evaluation and improvement steps converge to an optimal value and policy. Here pi star refers to optimal policy and v star refers to optimal values. But dynamic programming has very big problems. 
the first one being it calculates the values for every state possible this might not be feasible when the state space is large for example chess it has a huge state space second dynamic programming requires a model of the environment which might not be available for all environments third dynamic programming assumes complete knowledge of the environment if your model does not encode complete information these methods can go haywire because of these problems and computational infeasibility in large problems we go to the next class of problems which sample experience from the environment and learn from that these methods are called monte carlo methods monte carlo methods do not assume complete knowledge of the environment they require only experienced samples of trajectories from the actual interaction with the environment while dynamic programming is powerful because it considers all possibilities of next states that an agent might land in monte carlo methods sample actual trajectories from the environment and incrementally learn from that after sampling a trajectory from the environment monte carlo methods calculate the returns for every step then instead of calculating the expected returns the values are calculated using sample returns this is called monte carlo policy evaluation let's start by seeing how we can learn a state value function using monte carlo policy evaluation the algorithm is as follows we input a policy that has to be evaluated then we initialize our value function arbitrarily and our returns as an empty list we then loop for every episode First we generate an episode following policy pi initialize the g variable that is supposed to hold the return for every step now we loop for every step of the episode backwards first time step t minus 1 then t minus 2 and so on we calculate the return for that step by multiplying the previous return with gamma and adding the reward for that step unless that st appears in the trajectory before this step we append g to the returns list and then we update the value for that state using average of all the returns seen for that state this is an evaluation algorithm which estimates state value function for a policy in essence estimating the values for states are particularly useful in model based settings but what do we do in model free settings you guessed it right we use the action value function let's see how we can do policy iteration in model free settings first things first we use our action value estimate our policy is picking the action which has the most value now let's see the algorithm we initialize our policy function and action value function arbitrarily and our return such an empty list we then follow the same drill but this time with action value estimates for every episode we first select a starting state and follow policy pi to generate an episode we initialize our g variable we then start from the back of the episode and calculate the return for that step unless the state action pair st and at appears in the trajectory before it we append it to the returns list and we update our q values for that state and action by averaging all the returns observed for that state and action ultimately we improve our policy by changing the policy to take the action which has the maximum q value at that state At first Monte Carlo methods might seem natural since it samples from the environment its knowledge of the environment cannot be wrong but there are problems with this method too you see that Monte Carlo methods wait till the end of the episode and then perform learning steps this might not be an issue for problems that have short episodes but if your episodes are fairly long then the issue becomes significant in long episodes the learning becomes very slow An alternative to this is to perform one step updates. Instead of seeing the whole trajectory, we perform a learning step just after one transition. These methods are called temporal difference methods and they turn out to be one of the central ideas in reinforcement learning. As we've already seen a sample Monte Carlo update looks like this. On the other hand, temporal difference methods have bootstrapping updates like this. The term bootstrapping is used because this method uses the values for the next state and the reward to create a one step target. Notice here we do not use the returns. Instead the returns are inherently calculated using these sample one step updates. TD policy evaluation for state value function looks like this. We have our policy which has to be evaluated. 
then we initialize our step size alpha and the values for all states are initialized arbitrarily except the terminal which is initialized to zero for each episode we initialize a state then for each step of the episode we take an action given by our policy we observe reward r and state s dash we then perform our one step td update to the values of this state we make the next state as the current state and loop until s is the terminal state this algorithm looks very simple and easy to implement because it uses one step td updates similar to monte carlo and one step td methods we can use n step bootstrapping methods this is sort of a middle ground between the two extremes in practice we find td methods to work very well and it also matches with how humans and animals learn before moving on further let's take an example to understand the difference between monte carlo and temporal difference updates a little bit more in depth let's say you are driving home from work and you try to predict how long it will take for you to reach home Let's say you leave office exactly at 6 o'clock and you estimate it will take 30 minutes to get home. As you reach your car, it is 6:05 and it is starting to rain. Traffic is often a little slower in rain, so you predict that from there it will take 35 minutes to get home. Then you found the highway to be fairly empty and after 20 minutes you exit the highway and estimate it will take 15 minutes more. As soon as you get onto a secondary road you unfortunately get stuck behind a slow truck. From now you predict it will take 10 minutes more. At 6:40 you enter your home street and you predict it will take 3 minutes more. When you arrive home it is 6:43. It therefore took you 43 minutes to reach home from office as opposed to your very early prediction of 30 minutes. Now the question is how do you model this as a reinforcement learning problem? It is evident that your states are these. The rewards are the elapsed times. For example, the reward at reach car is five. The reward at exiting highway is fifteen, which is twenty minus five. Since the rewards are elapsed times, the actual return is the actual time to reach home from that state. I have included another column to make that evident. The value of each state is the predicted time to go. Why? Since the predicted time to go calculates the amount of time slash reward that can be collected, this is how we model it as a reinforcement learning problem. For simplicity, we keep the discount factor and alpha as one. When you run Monte Carlo and TD methods, the updates for these two methods can be drawn on a graph. You can see that in the Monte Carlo case, the values for all the states are updated to the actual outcome. whereas for td methods the values are updated based on the next estimates think about it for a moment and then we'll talk about why this is better let's say the next day you leave office you again estimate the time to be 30 minutes but you get stuck in a huge traffic jam at the highway because of an accident even after 25 minutes you are stuck there as you are stuck in traffic you immediately understand that you cannot make home in 30 minutes Monte Carlo methods do not help you learn that while you are in the episode as they learn after the episode is complete. On the other hand since TD methods are one step updates you will immediately understand while stuck in traffic that you will not require 30 minutes but 50 minutes. Therefore TD methods are truly online whereas Monte Carlo methods are not. Now it might not be obvious as to why TD methods would work. Why would one step updates work? Understand this when you are playing chess after a few initial moves you predict that you will win towards the end of the game when there are only a few moves left you predict that you will definitely win this new prediction near the end of the game is more confident than the previous one near the start of the game taking this concept to the extreme for one step updates the prediction at the next step is better than the previous one TD methods assume that whatever you predict one step later is a better prediction than the current one. Therefore, we should update our current prediction towards the next one. Now, let's look at some TD algorithms. The first one is Sarsa. Sarsa uses an update function which looks like this. The target is the reward for that step plus gamma into action values for step ST plus one and action AT plus one. 
The algorithm begins with initializations of alpha and epsilon and action value function. All states of the action value function is initialized arbitrarily except the terminal state which is set to 0. For each episode we initialize s. Then we choose action a using a policy derived from q. This policy can be epsilon greedy. For each step we take action a and observe reward r and state s dash. Then we choose action a dash using the same policy. Then we perform a td update to the q values of state s and action a. We make the next state as current state and the next action as the current action and continue to loop until s is a terminal state. Let's apply this algorithm to a windy world. The wind blows from bottom to top and the agent has to reach a goal from a starting cell. The graph shows the agent's performance while learning using SARSA and it was eventually able to learn a good policy. The increasing slope of the graph shows that the goal was reached more quickly over time. Note that Monte Carlo methods would not work here because the termination of the episodes is not guaranteed. The agent can take a left and right action infinitely and therefore the episode wouldn't end. SARSA on the other hand does not have this problem because they learn during the episode that such policies are poor and switch to something else quickly. Now SARSA is an on-policy algorithm. On-policy methods attempt to evaluate or improve the same policy that is used to make decisions. Off-policy algorithms evaluate or improve a policy different from that used to generate experiences. The agent behaves with a certain behavior policy while learning an optimal policy also called target policy. The behavior policy is often a little more exploratory than the target policy. Now why would someone use something like this? Understand that in order to learn optimal values, one needs to behave non-optimally in order to explore all actions, in order to find the optimal actions. On policy algorithms learn values not for the optimal policy but for a near optimal policy that still explores. Off policy algorithms learn an optimal policy while behaving with a more exploratory policy. That's why off policy algorithms are more powerful than on policy algorithms. An off policy algorithm for TD control is Q learning. Probably this is the most widely used algorithm in reinforcement learning or at least a deep version of it. The update for Q learning is this. The target is the reward for that current state plus the gamma into action value at state st plus 1. Remember the difference from SARSA here. The target values for SARSA is taken for an action given by the policy. Whereas in Q learning, the target values is given by the action which is optimal in that state. The algorithm is completely similar to SARSA except we have replaced the SARSA update with QLearning update. Let's apply the two algorithms on an example and compare the difference. We apply it on a cliff wall problem. There is a 4 cross 12 grid with a cliff on it. The goal is to start at state S and reach G without falling into the cliff. The reward is minus 1 for all transitions and minus 100 if the agent falls into the cliff after which the episode terminates. After running SARSA and Q-learning on this world with an epsilon greedy policy, SARSA finds a safer path through the grid which is the blue one, whereas Q-learning finds the optimal path which is the red one. The evaluation metric in the graph is the total rewards for each episode. Both of our algorithms learn policies that reach the goal fairly well. But see that SARSA is able to collect more rewards than Q-learning. The reason for this is because of our epsilon greedy policy. Since Q-learning finds an optimal path which is close to the cliff, the exploration often results in the agent falling into the cliff. This is not the case with SARSA and that's why it's able to collect more rewards than Q-learning. The takeaway fact from this comparison is that off-policy algorithms are often stronger than on-policy algorithms because they find optimal policies quickly and therefore are widely used. That was quite a role for us. We talked a lot about things that make reinforcement learning as powerful as it is today. It's okay if you didn't understand everything. The takeaway for this video is what TD algorithms are and how they are used. 
Since no learning is complete without applying it practically, we will start coding out these algorithms. In the next video, we will start with coding SARS and Q-learning in this tabular case and apply them to a pretty famous problem. So stick out for the next one and see you there.